morning, everybody. I get this clerk to say the pledge. I mean, the prayer. Mr. Thomas, say the pledge. Please stand. <laughs> Cassidy and Gilry CPA, uh, 2022 audit finance statement. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Cool. First one, I like that. <laughs> um, real quick, we did do the audit uh, for the police group for the year ending December 31st of uh, 2022. Uh, we issued an unmodified, a clean opinion, it means everything's in order. Uh, there was no findings, no reportable conditions uh, for the year. Um, I'm not going to go over anything in, in the book at all, but just let you know if you want to look at the book, uh, pages 15 and 17 are the two most important pages. That's the balance sheet and the profit and loss. Uh, basically, for the unrestricted funds, it was a profit for the year. Uh, and also, if you look at your fund balance, uh, your fund balance is sitting at about 200% of the annual, annual operating expenses. As a rule of thumb, 50% is considered a, a good financial position, so certainly the police jury is, is sitting in a very strong financial position. Uh, that's a quick of it. I'm uh, available for uh, any questions at any time, guys, and we certainly appreciate the visit. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Got a couple of green cards. We're going to go in real quick. Uh, Katie, you want to talk? Katie? Uh, you're a fire station. Yes, Mr. Joe. So we didn't add this to the agenda, but uh, very recently there's been some discussion about what to do at Mary Fire Station. So just to take you guys back a few months ago, um, last year at the end of 2022, we voted to fix Mary Fire Station, put it back to free storm conditions. The bid was $1.9 million. So I provided a field report to you guys to review. It shows you what Murray Fire Station looks like as of yesterday. Um, I also invited the fire board um, representatives, the board members, the fire chief, Mr. DuPont, um, his captain, Logan Manuel, are here to address the jury about some of their ideas and some of their concerns about moving forward with re repairing Murray Fire Station. And I think we have some members from the community who might like to speak up. So, uh, if you don't have any questions for me, um, <coughs> if uh, Fire Chief uh, Timothy Klein can come to the mic. Okay, okay. any questions? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the insurance on the two buildings, Kate, uh, what are we paying over there in Grand Chenier and in Murray Beach? So, in Grand Chenier, it's going to be around $50,000 a year from your end. Grand Chenier is 40000 and some change. The trucks, that when they get their total, they get it all together. So the trucks for Myriad and Grand Chenier is about 56000 I mean 5600 a year. So when you add that in, it pushes it up to the 50 marker. But the building itself for Grand Chenier is forty, and the building itself for uh, Myriad is thirty three. Okay. You're saying $40,000? Yes, sir. For the building. To house the truck? 
Yes, sir. Yeah. But but Grand Chenier has the water. The Grand Chenier Fire Station. The house of truck. They also have an Gee, office. They, they have an office and a conference room and stuff on the inside and too. The waterworks works out there too. And the waterworks works out of that building. And and that it also includes forty thousand dollars worth of contents coverage. Now that has a bathroom, a full kitchen, and everything. And the fire department mm -hmm. all that. Well, the fire department, the way we always had to redo it, they, they paid the insurance on Murray. The waterworks paid the insurance in Grand Chenier. But the, the, the waterworks is like it. They, they really want to move to Murray because it's in between and switch it over where they'll pay the insurance there. But either way, either way, the fire department pays one and the waterworks pays the other. Either way you want to do it. I'm just saying that it's, it's mind boggling to, to think that you got to pay $40,000 to house a truck. No matter what kind of building, because they're on the ground. You know what I'm saying? They're not elevated, so you're going to pay it. All right. I'm sorry. It's not going to save you fifty thousand a year because you still got to insure the bottom part. You can't just fix it without insurance. But we're looking at cutting that to around ten thousand bucks for insurance. which That's to me the contract is null and void because they didn't secure the upper levels that tore off. Yeah, but they, they under contract, so, they, they have to fix it. I, they have to fix it. So I, I say we both walk away and just yeah. not build the top back and just put a roof over the department of truck. That, that's what the board was saying. How much is the so, roof? That's just it. it, it when they was gonna build numbers. a roof floor, we absolutely say no. Okay, so we're under contract with Alpha Palmer. You know, I don't think we can break the contract without calls or without, you know, their blessing. So right now, if we're under contract for 1.9 million. We've already paid out close to $400,000 on this building already between the engine, from, between the architect and the contractor. We did ask them to provide a quote to abandon the second floor and just put a new roof over the bottom floor and just make it a fire safe, just a fire garage to store the trucks. The problem with that is that all of the power was routed to the second floor. So you still incur costs rerouting all of the power to the bottom floor. So after you do that change order, you're still going to have $1.3 million invested in this building to abandon the second floor and just make it a fire garage as is. Now, we didn't get any hard quotes to demo the building completely. We did look at it on site um, about a year and a half ago with some engineers, architects. Uh, Randy Thomas, our project manager, was there. We estimated it was going to take between $100,000 and $200,000 to demo the entire building because it's solid concrete, steel. Um, so by the time you hire someone to come in, demo it, haul it off, pay for disposal fees. So you pay $400,000 to fix the building where it is today. Another hundred thousand dollars to demo the building. You're already going to have four hundred thousand dollars in the area. You don't have anything to show for it. Then you do the fire garage. Plus so that's option one. Option two was, hey, look, let's abandon the second floor. One point three million. Option three is just fix it. Well, so, didn't they say how much it, they no. walk away from it? How much that was going to be? Oh, contractor. He I thought the only expenses were to the attorneys uh, for the suit lawsuit. <laughs> I guess the insurance company, I thought that was the 400 close to 300 and something thousand. For what? I'm sorry. Uh, when you talked about the expenses that we've paid so far, I thought that was going toward the attorneys for the lawsuit. No, that was what we paid to the, to the architect, 
for bidding it out and the contractor. And so the contractor did incur some cost already. You know, all the work they've done out there to date, which is all the, the um, breaking down, cleaning, um, they have a labor costs for that. They had to purchase a, a bond for the year, like, you know, a builder's risk insurance policies. You know, they actually did order the roof to fix it. That's a few hundred thousand dollars. So we would have to pay for all of that because under contract, they incurred those costs. We we're liable for them. Now, anything, any work that they hadn't done so far, of course, you know, they would be open to ending the contract there, but they would want to make sure that they covered for all of the costs incurred plus a little bit extra money for their time um, because they were depending on this job, you know, and part, it was working uh, through their struggle. Yes, sir? So you say that the, with Thomas, uh, the waterworks would pay for the insurance, the building? The, yes, so the water board, when, when Haley and then went and met with the water board at the time, and I believe Ms. Tina Horn's here to represent the water board, they said that they would relocate their staff to Mure and, and operate out of Mure and make that their office. But that means they would not run any office out of Grand Chenier and the Drew would be responsible for Grand Chenier or the fire department. Okay, because I was under the impression that they was no longer willing to operate the uh, Mure estate. I haven't heard anything different from the water board. Okay, so if we don't have to pay for it, that's, that's between the water board and with it, but Tina, Tina's here. If, if we're gonna have to pay with the water board, if it dials them a year just for insurance on the place, it's not feasible, it's not doesn't make sense. I'm not having just the part of the truck, yes, ma'am. Okay, I want to give you a little history on, on the water work and the fire uh, buildings. When those buildings were built, the water board paid for and had the contract for the Muriac Fire Station. The water Board paid for that out of Avalon taxes. Well, actually back then it was, it was, um, it was taxes, but um, it was from the bond issues. But it came out of the waterworks. The fire department paid for the building in Grand Chenier because at that time, you know, there were a lot more people in Grand Chenier and they wanted something different in Grand Chenier. So, uh, Water Board has been paying, to my knowledge, has been paying the insurance for Murier all these years, and, and the utilities. So, it's actually Water Board's building, but the, the thing was, and, and that, when the bond issue was passed, not only was the water lines put in, but those two buildings came in, and and it also um, there was a bond issue for fire. So that's how it went down. Now you know the the story of the of buildings. Normally, it should have gone back like y'all did it, and um, I just you know I'm not an attorney or anything, but. When the contractor was tearing down that building, he should have known how it was built and that it wasn't gonna hold itself up because everything was tied <coughs> into that roof. And when you take the whole roof down and you leave up walls and it's not tied in, what's gonna happen? They're gonna fall. So that's what happened. So I don't know where their lawsuit is. I don't. I mean, to me, the contractor has a lot uh, to be responsible for. I think they're okay with that. Now. They're going to fix it. They're going to assume that, that for them. Okay. So I think um, the best thing to do is rebuild. Now, if it was me from, from just a financial standpoint, I would say uh, we just need, we need fire protection. Um, but since we have the money, since it's been bid out, let's keep going. But now we shouldn't have to wait on that contractor to, for his lawsuit. He no, should I, mean, be, I, I think they agree. They're ready to start, right? 
Yeah, they're ready to start. Because they haven't been back out there since those walls <laughs> fell. They just went and cleaned it they up. They just cleaned it up. They agreed to pay for the generator, too, that right. it fell on. So, I mean, everything's in line. As long as they agreed to pay yeah. for it, we're good. That wasn't the story that you just told. I, I was Y'all talk to somebody, Tom? So Y'all talk to somebody? Mm -hmm. They go pick that Katie up. Yeah, Katie and they've been working on nothing back. Yeah, so they're going to repair or replace the generator. They don't want to give us the cash, uh, the credit on it. Yes. They just want to repair or replace it. They're going to take care of it. And the section of the wall that fell is their responsibility. Um, it's not a lot of money because um, mm -hmm. they were going to have to fix just a few studs. I mean, they were going to have to rewire everything and re-bracket everything. They were willing to give us credit for the two walls that fell, or two walls. And then we chose them to take down the third wall before it fell. Okay. So. Is everybody agree oh, uh, uh, So we ain't all here. What, so what, what, what do y'all want? I want to put it back. Why are y'all here? Well, there, there was a lot of talk back and forth. We needed, all heads needed to come in one room, and it never did. Oh, okay. and the reason was. Uh, I agree with that. We, we were thinking it's going to be our responsibility to pay the $50,000 a year just to have the building, which we just need to walk the truck in. Okay. That's why we're here. Right. All good. Sounds like if somebody else wants to pay that, then we're good. We all agree with that, good. No, we, no. we don't need a motion. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone's on the same page yeah. now. Everyone's yeah, good with the direction. They agree. And we'll, okay, well, I've got Tim up here, too. Uh, I, I, I know I like to thank Tim and all our fair people that are working with him. Uh, we've had a bunch of fires here lately. Uh, they were up, up around the clock. I don't know how many nights probably there was a fire here, fire there, all that fire out here. I'd uh, like to say it's a great group of guys. Volunteers and the uh, those from the road crew, great group of guys, and they really stepped up. In a couple of years, y'all see after the training we're fortunate enough to get from Venture um, Global, they've offered us a lot of training. It's going to be a really good group that we're going to have, and they're involved. So I guess at least to say I'm proud of you. Oh, thank y'all. Appreciate it. Thank y'all. Yeah. Hey, uh, I got one question. Is the, is the water work going to go back to Murray at their office when it's all said um, Whatever the jury wants us to do, because we have no preference. Um, you know, we we were in Grand Chenier because more people were there. Now it doesn't matter. I think it's central. The, the girls that work for the water works are saying that's more of a central location. Frio and Grand Chenier work out of the same building. So we don't have no more Frio. Well, you won't need all the infrastructure you got in the Grand Chenier. I mean, I mean, it's there. It's not it's not it's not the the but they don't have no, no community center really over there. Yeah, there's so nothing. There's nothing in Grand Chenier. If you so speaking you of Grand Chenier, over there as a well, water, water board meetings, gas and birthday. I mean, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm good with all of it. I yeah. just wanted to understand it. <laughs> And Grand Chenier Fire Station is under contract to be restored to pre-storm conditions, and it's close to being finished. Yeah, it's not much to it. It's, it was still there. They were able, uh, our project manager, Randy Thomas, he uh, steerheaded that project. Just like our Grand Lake Fire Station? Yes, waiting on power. Waiting on power. <laughs> with All right. Yep. Everybody good with it? We'll move on. Uh, Thank y'all. I Thank appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to number four, the Gregory Agency, Employee Group Insurance Renewals. Good morning, I'm Richie Gregory with Gregory Benefits and Consulting, also known as Hub International. Um, does everybody have a packet? So what we'll do first is talk about the health insurance. In the left-hand side of the packet, uh, probably the second handout for you all, you should have a couple pages with a bar graph on it. This is just gonna be showing, if you'll turn to the second page, 
would like to give you an idea of how much you're paying in premiums to Blue Cross and what are they paying out in claims. So this is a year-over-year -year report, the top section. You look at the very last column um, from July of 2032 through June of 23. so this is pretty much fresh data here. Uh, Blue Cross has paid out $2,837,000 in claims. You all have paid in $2,917,000 in premiums. So basically, they've paid about 97% of what they took in, they paid out in claims alone. So they've clearly lost money on the police jury over the tw last 12 months. So what has happened is we were, uh, Blue Cross released an increase of, uh, you'll see on the spreadsheet, a 6.9% increase. We did go out to the marketplace and look at other carriers in addition to Blue Cross. So by the way, if you look uh, on this spreadsheet here, uh, option five was United Healthcare, option six was Aetna. So when we sent it out to the marketplace, United Healthcare actually came in and matched the Blue Cross renewal of the 6.8% increase or 6.9% increase. So there's no savings there to change to United. Uh, basically, what they were doing was just kind of shadow pricing the renewal. They're saying the renewal for Blue Cross is fair, but if y'all weren't happy with Blue Cross's service or whatever, then you could move to United. Uh, Aetna, you'll notice, was a 10% increase. So they were pretty much out of the picture. So. It's so our recommendation in looking at this that you would stick with Blue Cross. Then we did run some different options for you all if you were interested in looking at other plan designs to offset that increase in premium. Yeah, that's the four options? Yeah, it would be, yes, our option one, two, three, and four. That's correct. Yep. So we've got it down to basically where you could have you know, no increase. Would it, would, so is the change of benefits is going to change? In these options? Yes, sir. So, example, op option one, we would be the, the main change there is that you're changing a person's maximum liability in the year from $2,500 on one person to $4,000. So, that's option one. Everything's remaining the same except for the out of pocket maximum going from $2,500 to $4,000. Option two, so by the way, anything in blue represents a change in benefits. So, option two, we would be changing the out-of-pocket to 3,250. So it's not as high as a change in the out-of-pocket, but the deductible went up from 750 to 1,000, and then the doctor's office co-pays go up. What is the difference in money? Uh, okay, I see it. So down at the bottom, you'll yeah. see the employer, so the jury's responsibility in the year. So currently, this is a, on a monthly basis, <laughs> you're spending 237,000 going up to 254,000. And then across the board, you'll see the other options um, as far as what the jury would save on a monthly basis. So I did do the math. So for example, if we didn't make any changes at all, kept the plan just as it is today, the jury is gonna spend $198,000 more for the next 12 months. We kept everything the same. 198,000. Don't we have a cost share? Uh, share you do? Well, so the jury, yeah, the, the jury pays 100% of the employee portion of the premium, and then you all are charging 5% of the premium for those people that are covering dependents. You have a spouse, child, family, they're paying 5% of that cost. I don't know if this might sound weird, but uh, the, what would the employees' rates go up? I do have that. Um, if we didn't change anything at all, obviously the employee doesn't change because you're paying all of that. The employee spouse rate goes up from $93.12 a month to $99.55. A family goes from $132.70 to $141.85. And the child rate goes from $86 to $92. What's the $10 a month? Yeah. You, uh, you said that it's going up 198 if we don't change anything. What's it go up if we do change? How much is going up? Well, if you did change, I mean, it depends on which option we pick. So I did the math on option four as an example, um, where you basically go up $49,000 a year, 4000 a month. So what, which one are you 
recommend? I, I don't necessarily recommend. I just recommend that Ayla. you stay with Blue Cross. Kayla, what would you, Ayla, what would you uh, recommend? Well, I just said if you're there, if you want to be with employees, I mean, you would just stay with the same one because anything else, you're just going to add It's not the highest paying job in the world. Guys are already so stressed. I'd just rather leave it alone, the coverage alone, it's my opinion. Uh, <coughs> everything goes up. Hopefully, we got money down the road to pay for everything, or we'll have to start the future, like passing it on. But as it stands <laughs> now, I think we financially sound enough to. And 6.9% increase is still not that bad. I remember that. I remember some 12 and 15 percent increases we yeah, had. Yeah, so we're going that hard, then we can start looking at it. Well, employees don't have to do it. They don't deserve it. So they just stay the same and they just the same. Look at the go, go, go with what we got. Okay. Um, Nobody likes change, I can tell you, especially if you're an employee and making that little bit of money uh, compared to a lot of people. Right. World. Right. Uh, they make good money, but compared, compared to other people, they don't make. And I will make you all aware too, just because you may be seeing some publicity about it. But Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana is in the process of trying to, in essence, sell to uh, Blue Cross plans. And if, what you have, Blue Cross of Louisiana is a not-for-profit company. Blue Cross in 14 states had been operating under the name Anthem. Last year, they changed the name to Elevance. Well, Elevance, in 14 states, Blue Cross, they're trying to acquire Blue Cross of Louisiana. You have a not-for-profit company being sold to for-profit. Um, I guess I'm on the record here. <laughs> you know, personally speaking, as a broker representing our clients, you know, we're not necessarily sure that this is a good deal for the policyholders of Louisiana to the extent that you're going from a non-profit to a for-profit. So just instantly in my mind, there's gonna have to be a change in premiums, you know, so. Next year. Yeah, well, we'll see. Well, it, it won't even close likely for another year, and then you'd probably see another couple of years. I will tell you that I think it was going to happen for certain. Now, I think some of the politicians, those running for governor, those running for insurance commissioner, others are starting to take a closer look at this. Some attorneys are starting to get involved, so we'll see exactly what happens. Uh, but I just wanted you all to be aware of that. So it would still be Blue Cross. Mm -hmm. It's just it would be Blue Cross in essence of California, New York, Georgia, Indiana, some of the other states, Tennessee. So it's just, you know. Uh, insurance is a, uh, to me, is a racket. But, uh, you know, it's a big, uh, big mess. And we suffer dearly in Cameron Parish right. because of our location. Uh, our, our people can hardly pay for homeowners insurance, flood insurance, right. all that skyrocket. Yep. Uh, and and we really need people in positions that's going to fight for us to fight against the insurance company. Right. I, I really believe that uh, the insurance companies are getting getting away with murder uh, by charging these outrageous prices on these on, on not just health care uh, health insurance, but right. all of them insurance. Correct. Right. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, so we get people in there that's going to fight for us, and, and uh, I think we got to look at our candidates as we do. Yep. And uh, I know Mr. Barrett here, he and I've had a lot of conversations about all the insurance stuff. I don't personally handle property casualty, but I'm familiar with it and all that. And you know, I fish again. We have some discussions about all that. So, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's there's a lot going on in that market. But I will say to Kayla's point, you know, at least we're not here facing. <laughs> Your claims have been bad, and the fact that we only got 6.8, 6.9 is really remarkable in the environment because it's not unusual to see 20% increases in some of our cases. So, Thank you, sir. Um, did want to mention on the other side of the packet, uh, we've got dental and vision. So there's a spreadsheet in there talking about that. We are recommending that you all switch your dental and vision from a company called Reliance Standard that it's with today to MetLife. Uh, basically, what happened was, if you look at the spreadsheets, we had a 10, uh, excuse me, a 25% increase in the dental rates from Reliance. We can move it to MetLife, 
I think everybody knows the name MetLife, uh, with no increase holding the rates for the next two years. We also improved the benefits because we've raised the annual maximum that a person could receive in benefits from $1,500 to 1750 and it covers implants. So it's actually better coverage, no increase, two-year rate guarantee on that. So that's your, that's your recommendation? Yes, sir. And then you all do have two plans, dental plans. You have what's called a low plan mm -hmm. and a high plan. There's very few people on the low plan. It's a, it's a cheaper plan. But we're also improving that by moving it to MetLife. Um, and, and not to get lost in the weeds, but the, the old plan was what's called a maximum allowable charge. So you'd go to the dentist if you were on the low plan, like I said, very few people. But you'd go to the dentist and they could say, oh, the dentist charged twice what we allow. And so you were stuck paying half the bill. We're going to switch that to what's called a 90th percentile plan, where pretty much even if you're on the low plan, what the dentist is charging, most of it should be allowed. I was not aware. We just took over the account obviously last year. So I didn't know it was a MAC plan. And I said, as soon as I saw that, we don't do those. So we switched it to improve that as well. And then on the vision, uh, we would just recommend moving it to MetLife just because we like to have dental vision in the same place, but the premiums would be staying the same as you were paying before. Okay. The doctor's uh, network of, yes, sir, it'd be VSP is the, the vision network. As far as dentists, while MetLife does have a network, there are very few dentists. Dentists in Louisiana don't typically want to be in the network. So that's why we structure the plan of what's called the 90th percentile. We just say, hey, go where you want to go. Benefits are the same. Good deal. All right. Anybody got any questions? Anybody good? Katie, you got any questions? Mark and Israel? Thank you all. We appreciate the business. All right. All right uh, five, the PCOR group. Mike Bisho and David Koch represent the PCOR group. Uh, happy to be with y'all. We've had the privilege of working with Cameron Parish for several years now. Just a quick check in on, on the legislative uh, update. Uh, never a dull moment at the legislature as, as, there, as there was this year. Uh, the legislature did go into a special session talking about insurance. <coughs> they had a special session early this year, if y'all remember, uh, to set up an incentive fund. I think they put $45 million into a, an incentive fund to get more companies to write in Louisiana, create more competition, hopefully give all of us opportunities for additional in insurance. Um, that is still playing out. Uh, we haven't really seen the, the effect of that yet. Uh, the regular session that rolled around shortly after that and just finished up in June 8th, uh, there was a lot of talk about insurance. Um, there, you know, there's still a lot of focus on the, the, the roof program and everything else, but. Uh, as, as always, at the end of the term, where we are now, where the governors can't run, the governor can't run for re-election, and all the legislators are up for re-election, we saw a lot of fireworks, a lot of theatrics going on in, in the session. Uh, much of it was centered around money. Uh, they actually had a, 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 an abundance of, of riches, so to speak, surplus from last year, surplus from the current year, and surplus going into the new budget year, which started on July 1st. So we saw a lot of jockeying and, and, and fighting over, over funding. Um, the governor did exercise his veto authority on several bills, some funding measures, and several other bills. The legislature actually called themselves back into a veto override session yesterday for the third time. This is the third time uh, they've gone into a veto override session with this governor. They actually brought up several bills, but they only overrode one bill, which was actually a, a a bill dealing with gender, uh, gender uh, treatment for kids. Uh, so they did override that bill, but none of the other bills were overridden. So the governor's vetoes of several bills and several projects uh, were sustained. Of course, we are in an election year. Uh, so the, the top of the ticket is the governor and all the statewide elected officials. So right now, uh, as all of you know, it, it looks like the way the polls are showing that the leaders in the governor's race are Jeff Landry securing 20 or 25 percent on, on the right and then Sean Wilson as the only uh, high-profile Democrat currently securing 20 25 percent on the left you have Treasurer Schroeder Stephen Wagesback the CEO of Lobby uh, Senator Sharon Hewitt Hunter Lundy 
uh, Representative Richard Nelson. Uh, I may be missing one or two, but those are kind of the guys that are that are fighting for the middle, all trying to to grow their numbers. They're all currently in in single digits in the latest polls, and they're trying to secure uh, to grow their numbers to to secure a runoff spot. Qualifying is about three weeks away, uh, so then at that point we'll know exactly how, how the field is set. Um, the election's October 14th. I know y'all are all up for re-election as, as well this year, but uh, all of our legislators are also up. There's about a third of the House and Senate members that'll turn over in each election cycle. Uh, several of the House, House members are running for their senator's seats if their senators are term limits, uh, term limited. I would predict that uh, our representative, Representative Buyak, is in a very good position for a leadership post uh, in the next term. Uh, he's served on Ways and Means and, and done a great job there. Uh, but who knows where he'll land. But I, I would predict that Ryan has taken care of his business uh, and he's, you know, ha handles himself well around the Capitol. And I would predict Ryan have a, a good leadership post in, in, in the next term. So we look forward to that and obviously working with y'all to continue to secure funding for the, for the parish. David's going to give an update on kind of some of the specifics uh, as far as funding that, that came back to y'all or that will be coming back to y'all in the next few months from the capital outlay and appropriations bill. Hey, quick question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Did I hear you right that the veto override did not pass? They, they had, when they go into an override session like they did yesterday, they bring up every bill that was vetoed. And that was about 20, I think 20 or so yes, bills. Only, they, they took up votes on several, but only one was overridden. And which one was that? It, it's a House bill by Gabe Permit dealing with uh, gender changes for for minors. Oh, it was overridden. It was overridden. I don't want Correct. It, it was overridden. The House and the Senate both voted to override that one. So that, that was the only one that was overridden. Well, look, as, as Mike mentioned, there's uh, a lot about the money this session, and we were successful in receiving about $2.6 in capital outlay projects. Um, I have a one-pager that all of you should have right in front of you, about 450000 in cash for the breakwaters, uh, just under $2 million for the EOC Center, um, and a, another 200000 for the Marshall Street Pumps in addition to um, roughly $21 million for the new Cameron Ferry. That construction started early this year. We're expecting mid-2025 for that ferry to be completed. Um, but now that the, the project has been let for the ferry, those funds should flow pretty easily now. As, as you all know, um, just as well as we do, early on there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of struggle trying to get that, that project up and operating. But now the construction has been uh, initiated, we should see those dollars start to flow pretty freely. Uh, any questions I can answer on the funding, happy to. Uh, but just wanted to let you all know kind of what we walked away with this session. Um, would like to go on the record and, and thank Representative Buyak, as, as Mike mentioned, and uh, Senator Abraham, as they were obviously very instrumental in, in a lot of this funding. So this this 1.975 for that uh, our POC office, is, is, is that secure? That's secure. That's cash. We should be receiving a CEA from the Facility Planning Control Office. Um, Katie, I would say the next couple of weeks, if not sooner. But once that CA is executed, we can start drawing down funds. That's good. Did it go on? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. much. And, and one more comment. I said it's always a great day at the Capitol when Cameron Parish comes to cook and, and feed, feed the legislators. So, so y'all keep coming every year because they really appreciate that. Thank y'all. Thank you, sir. Curtis, you got to start cooking for kids' birthday parties and, and yeah. wedding. <laughs> Thank y'all. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's go to number six, Center Point Energy, update on services and cameras. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to stand before you to give an update on your, your natural gas service here in Cameron Parish. My name is Sam Walters. I'm the uh, district director for Center Point over the state of Louisiana. Uh, I have uh, several of my team members here. I want to quickly introduce them. Uh, so on the operations side, we have Mr. Brad Coppins. He's our area manager, office out of Lake Charles. That his team is the one that supports this area. Uh, we have Blaine Spell. He's our district ops manager. Uh, he is also out of Lake Charles. Uh, we have Brittany Welch. She's our marketing rep. I know she's kind of a local around here, so several people know her. Uh, she's the one you call when you need gas service. And then we have Drake Bourgeois, who is our engineering lead, engineering manager. He's office out of Broussard, 
And we also have Jim DeSherry, he's our regulatory manager. And we really just wanted to, to come before everyone uh, to, to celebrate a, a three year effort post storm to get natural gas service back to this, this area. It was a, a Herculean effort. Um, this team and so many others, and we put our heart and soul into recovering from the storm. And we also want to thank Commissioner Francis. We worked with, we worked with him uh, from time to time on making this happen. And I want to ask Brad to come up and just kind of talk a little bit about the, the effort and, and where we stand and, and where we are with that. Right. Yeah, Sam mentioned my name is Brad Coppage. I'm the area manager for Southwest Louisiana. So, um, I, you know, again, I also want to thank the police jury and the residents of uh, Cameron Parish. Uh, it's been a long road. Um, you guys know that, you know, when we got hit, we completely lost our system and, you know, we wanted to restore service as quickly as possible. So we had temporary trailers out, temporary, you know, little farm tap trailers out and anybody who needed gas service, you know, we were here to, to provide them the service they needed. Um, we fully commissioned our brand new system uh, in May of, of uh, this year. Uh, it's fully operational, so you guys should not see those 18 wheelers and those those little trailers around town anymore. Um, you know, it's it, it's uh, we when we redesigned the system, you know, we, we tried to look at different different ways that we can make it more storm storm resilient. So, you guys have seen some of our meter stations in the Creole area are, are now elevated. Our regular station, you know, coming down uh, towards Cameron is also elevated. Uh, we put in all plastic pipes, so if we ever do get inundated with, with water again, it's going to be easy to clean out. Uh, we put in some high-density plastic pipes, so we, you know, uh, we didn't have to put steel in for some of those high-pressure areas uh, coming in off Creole. So uh, valves in more places, valves at every service line, we can isolate the systems much more easier. So um, we're here, we're, we're operational, we're ready, we're ready to accept any customers who's interested. And um, you know, again, th thank you for everybody, and, uh, but we're glad to see this project is, it has completed. Yeah. I got a question. Sure. Uh, are y'all gonna have a place where you can walk in and talk to somebody? I had an issue a while back, and it wouldn't have been for Miss Brittany over there. I, I couldn't talk to nobody, talk to somebody in Carolina or wherever. I mean, you know. Yeah. You know, I don't know if we ever had an office down here. Well, we had this Ed Smith for years that we. I, that's what I was going to say. He was kind of like a yeah. mobile office, right? Yes. Um, okay. Now I, I do know some of the, the residents around town uh, they <coughs> like seeing the same technicians, so we do have a lot of the same technicians come down through here. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of them have uh, phone numbers for this technician, uh, but you know, I don't think uh, it's in the plan to have an actual office in camp. What about Lake Jones? I mean, I'm we do have an office in, well, we don't accept payments, but you can come drink a cup of coffee with us. Yeah. <laughs> a couple times I've been there, you could get into place. Yes. That's yeah. I, I yeah. finally got a hold with Brittany. She helped me out to yeah. get my and, problem and, solved. And Brittany is, uh, oh, you know, God. yes. So uh, we, we try to be visible in the community as, as uh, you know, best we can. So. Okay, I'll do the good job. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave a grill, so thank y'all for the service y'all did. Yes. The bottles in now, back in service. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, I, I, go ahead. Well, I was going to say on the on the payment centers. I don't know. It was probably twenty years ago. The company. It was just the way these companies were going. They closed a lot of the payment centers. Um, you know, we do have a call center that we have call reps sitting there waiting to take calls to solve any problems that you may have. Um, so our our system is up and running. I also want to just remind everyone that if you have any excavation projects, please call eight one one. The the system that we built. Um, you know, it is plastic, you know, if you dig into it, we're gonna have some problems for this down. So just a reminder, everyone, it's the law, call 811. Somebody will come out and mark your line and uh, respect the, the mark, so. Sorry, there was another question. Yes, sir. Sweet, <coughs> you'll stop on the main highway. <coughs> My little road along has got five propane tanks. The other road's got five propane tanks. And you're gonna run the lines the rest of the way in Sweet Lake. We get asked that question constantly. I would say contact Brittany and each each area has its unique, you know, we have to look at it from an economic perspective. Um, and so contact Brittany, she'll get the details and, and we can talk about it. Okay. Yeah. I need your number. Yeah, for <laughs> you leave. You know, and more, you know, every resident who's interested, it's easier to extend the system. And so um, just names and numbers and you know, we can do all the 
research and all the you know yeah, probably about I mean, thirty to fifty residents. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're we're limited by what we can do um, for no charge by our tariff. So there's a certain amount of you know there's a footage per customer limit in there, but um, beyond that we have to look at the economic study to, to make sure it's a viable project. So you at the Pack Bay, right? Just south of the Pack Bay there. No offense, first, but I don't live in Hackberry. We've had a lot of interest in that. Any other questions? Anybody questions? Anybody? All right. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got a couple of green cards here. Uh, Miss Susan Rockon, fraudulent <coughs> fine, Colin. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm here only as a public service. If you'll turn to the last page of your packet that you have in front of you. Yes, the one with alerts on it. And anyone that's in, the, uh, um, in their seats can get one in the back and we'll take a screenshot or whatever. Um, scammers, this is all about scammers and keeping you safe. Scammers record fake deeds in our offices in throughout the state. They take your property, they sell it or they mortgage it and you don't know anything about it until you get your tax papers in December or you see a for sale sign in your yard and you don't know what's going on. So this is something that the Louisiana clerks of court have developed to keep everyone abreast of anything that's happening with the names that you list when you create your account. It is an online service. You will get texting or uh, emails of your choosing. You need to choose statewide because these scammers will not record mortgages in your parish. They will record them in Shreveport, Baton Rouge, Monroe, but you're still responsible for them until you go to court. Okay? I know it's crazy. <laughs> It is crazy, and it's happening. It's happening to people just like you and me. You will access you, anyone that's tech savvy knows how to use a QR code. It'll bring you to the website that you can first, you register as a new user. Then it will return you back to the email that you list when you register, so you can acknowledge that it's you registering it, and then you will create your account. Then you will list your names, and with anything that happens, you will be notified within 24 to 48 hours statewide for the names that you have listed when you created your account. That way you can know what's happening in a short period of time instead of 12 months, or when you see a for sale sign in the yard that maybe is not your home place, but it's another piece of property that you own and they're selling it to someone else. Is there any questions? <laughs> it, it's a very good, uh, there are things on the TV now that you could pay for this service. The Clerks of Court of Louisiana is providing this to anyone statewide for free, forever. And oh, you you're not it. gonna use it until you get a text or an email that you provided when you registered and then you will know it. It's something you do and you forget about until it really happens to you. Okay, and another thing, uh, elections are coming up. Qualifying is going to be August 8th through 10th, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. You have a packet there. I have packets in my office for anyone that wants to qualify for any race, they can contact me at the uh, Clerk of Court at 337-775-5316. I'm at, I'm at your, uh, whatever you need, I'm here. Is there any questions? I'm good. Hey, do you have any questions? I know that you tried to get on earlier. I did it when I was talking to her. It took me probably like three and a half minutes. Good, good. It's very user-friendly. There. And also in the back, 
you will see a, an app for Go Vote. I want, please get on it. There is so much information on this Go Vote app that you can access before the election, during the election, after the election. You can get on the Secretary of State's website. Any questions you need can be answered. Okay? If that's, if no one has any questions, I'm done. Any questions? You know, did a great job. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. A uh, couple other. I got two of them about the golf cart. Uh, Tom, you want to go first? Or sure, yeah. uh, Mr. Ulysses, if you Whoever wants to go first, imagine. About the I'll, I'll, lay the, I'll lay the found work. Found uh, okay. Uh, so, many, many years ago, I've been around representing the police jury since 2003, so <laughs> a lot of things have happened in 20 plus years. But at one point, we had researched the idea of golf carts on public roads, and there was no way to get around the federal regulations, so forth and so on. But in 2015 or 16, our legislature uh, passed some statutes that basically allow golf carts and what they refer to as utility terrain vehicles on public roads. But it's up to you to decide it's your policy decision. One, do you want that? If you do, you have to pass an ordinance identifying those roadways parish roadways. You don't, have, you don't control state highways, but parish roads that you would allow golf carts or those utility vehicles to drive on. There's some other requirements in the statutes about age limits and driver's license and some liability and certain uh, uh, golf carts have to have certain uh, things on them, you know, that to be registered. I mean, there's all kinds of other uh, regulations for the golf cart or that terrain vehicle to be valid on your street, uh, but just the idea. The policy of doing that is up to you. Um, what's specifically excluded is there are no, uh, what they refer to as off-road vehicles, which are three-wheelers, four-wheelers, or other all-terrain vehicles. Those cannot be driven. There is no exception for four-wheelers, basically. Those would not be included. This is just golf carts and what we refer to commonly as side-by-sides. Um, so that's all I have to say, um, if you, unless you have any questions. Side-by-sides, they include razors, those high-performance vehicles. Pretty, pretty, so, so there, it's the statute, and we would your ordinance would copy the, the state statute or refer to the state statute. Utility, and, and for the public, this is, uh, 32 colon 299.3 and 299.1.2.3 and 299 .1 .2 .3, it all deal with each of those statutes deal with golf carts, mini trucks, or, you know, all the different aspects. But 299.3 says utility terrain vehicle shall mean any recreational motor vehicle designated for or capable of travel over roads uh, with a minimum width of 50 inches but not exceeding 74 inches and a minimum height of at least seven, oh, no, weight, sorry, not minimum weight of at least 700 pounds but not exceeding 3,000 or 3,500 pounds. Um, so, I mean, just, so it gives some dimension. So not every side-by-side -side will, it'll either be too big, too high, too light. I mean, so there are some, again, some regulations and parameters of what those side-by-sides would look like. So whether a particular one does or doesn't, it would have to fit within those widths and the height and uh, and weight. What about the speed limit? Do they do they require certain? No, that you know, and I was just looking at that, anticipating that might be a question, and there's not. It's just your public roads. It doesn't say a speed limit. Um, it just says the road. If you designate a road, it has to be. There's a signage. You have to put a sign. I don't know what the sign looks like, but I'm sure DOTD or somebody has some suggested sign that you would put on the road that this road is designated for utility or off road or, uh, or, or golf carts. Um, so that's the only um, 
your only requirement to, to just label a, a street sign. Yes, speed limit is probably whatever's on whatever. the Well, and, then, and yeah, the speed limit would just be whatever's on the, on the street, and that may be another policy decision is you don't want to allow them on a 45 mile an hour, but maybe on a 25 or 15, you know. So, Mr. Bruce, so this primarily came to me a few weeks ago from the Holly Beach crowd that, uh, you know, those speed limits. So it would be, for instance, the Holly Beach streets. I don't know if it's 25 or 15. So there would be, so that's, I mean, you're considering doing it. If you would consider it, uh, my recommendation is nothing more than a 25 mile an hour speed. So whatever road you consider, I would not accept or designate a road that has more than 25 miles an hour. That would get, to be to be we did get on, on a bear's landing. Yeah, a bear's landing is an example. It's 15 miles an hour and start up to 25 <coughs> in that area. So you would allow, you could allow, but uh, the road coming into a bear's landing, uh, 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 a bear camp road is 45 before you get to the community. I would not allow golf carts or utility vehicles at 40 on, on a street that had 45 miles an hour. That probably is unsafe, just in my opinion. Sure. They, they have a right before you get to those streets that, that where the houses are, it's reduced to 15 on that on that a bears yeah. landing road. So we'd have to be very specific about what, but but the point is, it's a policy decision. Do you want to, and, 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 and you have to make that decision today. This is just a green card for your consideration because some citizens asked me to, you know, present this to you the idea. You'd have to look at your streets in your communities, your district, decide which streets. You might want but consider i would not consider anything that has a current speed limit of more than 25 miles an hour well we could probably time for like like trucks and cars or whatever is on, on state highways mm -hmm. maybe have something with 45 for well the problem is if you put a golf cart yeah. put a golf cart on a road where there's 45 mile an hour speed limit somebody's gonna become 45 miles an hour and, and that it would it, imagine on the interstate 10 when people are going 80 miles an hour and there's somebody going 65 the 65 causes congestion and they're going to speed limit. You don't want a golf cart on a 35, 40 mile an hour road going 20 miles an hour. Heck, they're probably going to go 20, probably go 15 miles an hour with somebody coming 40 miles an hour one way or the other. It, that, that's potential for problems. That's why I say 25 mile an hour Harris Road would be my recommendation. And I'm sure the sheriff would agree, I would think. I don't want to speak for the sheriff. You know, up some, some verbiage. Uh, for an ordinance that we can oh no we'd have to adopt an ordinance you have to designate the, the roadways that you identify as these roads that allow golf carts and utility vehicles and we i would draft the ordinance all i would need to know is do you want to do it and what roads you want to designate i thought we already yeah. had we no, did no. that years we, we, we tried several years ago. No, no, no. Right. we couldn't do it, 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 it so tried on the beach right. and yeah. on the parallel. yeah now on, on the beach on the we beach put a speed park. limit that, i mean but uh on your on a public roadway before this legislation a few years ago, we could not, couldn't do it. Okay. Let me ask one last question. Or we didn't have the authority to do it, to say that. In the Hollow Beach area, they were talking about it. Uh, there's a lot of people that do black drive. They <clears throat> talked about adding, may make every stop, every intersection a four way stop. Is that something we have to change our ordinance on, or is that something we could do? That's okay. Totally different question. So just for traffic safety purposes, um, putting four way stops instead of just the two way again, that's between you and the residents. Uh, and, and I think we had that discussion as a, it's, a, it's, it's but if we did that, it wouldn't take a, it wouldn't take an ordinance. Oh, no, no. You, yeah, you, so, so you would have your, your, or, I know we have our roadways have, or have an ordinance that has speed limits. But I don't know that you have to, the ordinance, the ordinance doesn't include stop signs, but if you decide you want to do stop signs four-way, you just, again, make that policy decision, instruct your road bridge, and they'll put up stop signs. Yeah. Or you yeah. Yeah. All right. You know, that's, again, that's you and the community talking about what's appropriate. I'm, I'm for it. If you want to <coughs> write something up, uh, you guys, and, and it'll be something that you guys can do in your area and you choose to just come to. Yeah, we can do it. We can, we, if we did an ordinance next month and it was just Holly Beach roadways and you decided six months from now, we could, you, know, you could amend it to add later or take away. I mean, um, again, I, I just want, it, do you like the idea? Cause it would require a vote. And then what, and I know I can, Holly Beach, I can look at the map and figure out the, the, the streets. If there's any other communities or streets you want to just let Katie know, let the staff know, let me know, and we can include it. Redford Beach also all the little, Last, last question. Sheriff, are you okay with this? 
Yeah, I'm just fine. I would ask uh, that the police chair consider if, if we're going to do this for the, if you do decide to do the golf course thing for the, uh, what we call them, uh, uh, the recreational or the, uh, the place where a lot of tourists go or a lot of people have camps like the Holly Beach or the, or the A Bears Landing, uh, that you consider doing that for the residential neighborhoods, that's where your constituents are. So if we do this for uh, the recreational areas or the, the, the areas like that that we mentioned, there's a lot of people, thank God, come in from the outside to have camps there. I'm grateful for that. But also we have to consider the residents in Cameron Parish. They have golf carts too and they have neighborhoods that have speed limits of 25 and 15. So that's something to consider. We have a lot of neighborhoods like that. And I agree with uh, the DA completely, 100%. This set of speed limit, this set of road speed limit sign where the golf cart can operate. Uh, four wheelers and stuff like that, dirt bikes. Sometimes they get out of hand and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they put them on and so it'll be up to the police jury if we restrict it. Like Tom suggested, to use golf carts like the, the state on the scene. Yeah, the statute specific. Again, it's, we couldn't do it before if we didn't have the authority per state statute. To do that. They've right. authorized golf carts and these utilities. Uh, four wheelers, you do not have the authority no. to grant four wheelers or three wheelers <coughs> access to your public road, so we can't even include them. They're speci right. specifically right. excluded. So. Right. But if you just consider the uh, other neighborhoods also. Yeah, that's all I need to know from you all through either through the staff or directed to me. Tell me which streets you want it. And we, we, and I all can, these have to be certified with the state. No, so you're going to meet a requirement. Well, no, the, 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 the golf cart utilities, there, again, there's some specifics in there about, the, and, you know, and it's just there's a lot of regulations that go along. But, but again, that will be in your ordinance. I'll, I, when we adopt the ordinance, I'll have a bullet point for, you know, hey, if it's a utility vehicle, here's what, what's required. If it's a golf cart, here's what's required. So you have a talking points or we can publish all that. Uh, but it will, again, this is just the big picture. Do you want to do it? Sounds like you want to. We'll start drafting an ordinance and, and then we'll insert the streets that are designated to allow golf carts and terrain. What about the insurance? Yeah, so again, the statutes require insurance. Uh, yeah, th that's another one of those things. I will itemize all the requirements so that when it comes time to adopt the ordinance, uh, but I can give you, for instance, um, golf carts. Golf carts uh, shall be equipped with brakes, reliable steering apparatus, safe tires, rear view mirrors, red reflection warning devices on both the front and rear of the vehicle. The golf cart shall also be equipped with headlights, front and rear turn signal lamps, tail lamps, and brake lamps. Shall be registered with the state. You have to have a valid driver's license to operate it. Shall have liability insurance. That's some of the things I've highlighted. Uh, yeah. When you register it, you have to get a decal with the state. So you have to have a decal. So when the deputies are out and about, they'll see that you've passed inspection with the state and you've got your decal. So uh, they know you have all those things I just listed. So that's just for instance in the golf cart. And there's with the utility terrain vehicles, there are, there's some requirements also similar, but not exact. But so. So is there a place local where uh, they can get approved by the state? I mean, are they well, we have you have a, somebody here every Thursday. I'm assuming you know that they would. I don't know. Yeah, every Thursday, the Department of Transportation. You have provided an office, the Department of Transportation, and they come here every Thursday. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's somebody here every Thursday. Now, whether that person is qualified, qualified to issue that permit, so it may not be because they don't do everything here, and they provide a service and. We're, happy to have them, but they don't do 100%. You, they may send you to a particular office in Lake Charles if there's a particular person that certifies your your, your vehicle. I'm assuming they can do that at one of the bigger places. I, I don't know, so I don't we, know we, 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 we'd find that out and provide that to the folks. Yeah, if you have a homemade trailer, you got to go get that certified. Of, uh, what? I'm just talking about. So. Yeah, I, and I don't know the particulars, but we can find that out. 
Well, we have a problem in Holly Beach, and uh, like Tom says, the state law doesn't forget that. In Holly Beach, if we require that the, you, you allow four wheelers on the beach, so if we require them to trailer their four wheelers to the beach, the way the beach is, sometimes the parish roads actually get so stopped up with them unloading their four wheelers, some of you and I have talked about this, that you can't pass. So then instead, they, the constituents want us to let allow them to go to the beach with their four wheelers and not ride back and forth. So that's a problem that we that we have there. Either we have them trailer their vehicles and maybe develop a parking place for them, or we don't, or we don't allow them to go from their camps to the beach on their four wheelers. Well, Sheriff, we can't make that decision by law. We can't make it so by law, so, so we have to enforce that. Right. Yeah, unless we provide some type of unloading space right. for the <coughs> trailers. Well, they're, work, they're working in the parking areas, but that, that, that's a long way off. But uh, Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. <coughs> I, I do appreciate, Jeff, that you work with the people uh, <coughs> quite well, that they're very satisfied with the fact that nobody okay. can harass them. Right. Any other questions? So guys, if you if you are interested, then just please you know work with Shane first and um, identify the roads that we think are eligible and uh, make Do sure we, that it's actually a parish road. Which yeah, let Shane, 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 Shane in charge of parish roads. Let him know he'll identify those. Make sure that they're good. And he'll get with me and we'll uh, we'll include it in the order. We need to add just agenda. No, I don't think no it's probably. not. A, no, not until I draft it, and you know, maybe the next meeting I'll have something for you to consider it publicly. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, I got a card, uh, Mr. Legion. Designation of Holly Beach Street for golf carts and UTVs. Holly Beach Subcommittee. Mr. Legion. Oh, Mr. Legion. <laughs> So, like Ursula Jarn, I'm a resident and a business owner in Holly Beach. I own a Holly Beach Rental Getaway out there. And I'm just here on behalf of myself, and I know Craig's going to probably come up here, just to say that we're in support of the golf carts and the UTVs. Um, like the sheriff said, people are doing it today. We just want to pass, be able to do it with this ordinance or this this statue in the future. I know it doesn't address the four wheelers, but it does at least address the golf carts and the UTVs that they're riding today. The other thing is that we talk to a lot of the officers and they like to focus their efforts on stopping people, for not, not stopping stop signs, <coughs> going too fast, underage, things like that. But the, the residents that are following the laws, driving their golf carts, they should be able to be a, able to do that and go to the beach that recently we passed an ordinance. They were able to drive on the beach. Um, we've had no incidents since that ordinance was passed. We'd like the same residents to be able to drive their vehicles over there and not have to um, part them in. So just, just talking on behalf of a lot of the residents, we've ta I've talked to quite a few of the residents over there. They're all in support of it. You know, They've been doing it for many, many years, but unfortunately they've been doing it illegally. So we'd like to now since we have this act, you start doing it legally. Okay. We never, we never have a problem on the beaches until we started getting people that come from outside of this community, our communities, and just destroying everything we had there for so, for so long. Now we're in a place where we got to start passing laws and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. yeah. Just a little handful of people coming. So I can tell you as a, a business, like I said, I rent three houses out there today. And I really do, um, I try to make sure the people that come there, I even have a book for them telling them what they can and can't do, things like that. I try to really encourage good people to come out there. We've had people come out there and they, they pass up stop signs. I will go to their house, tell them, look, you need to follow the laws. You need to stop at the stop signs. Your kids don't need to be on the four wheelers or, or the golf carts and things like that. So we try to enforce it because we don't want a problem out there. We want the good residents and the good visitors because we're getting a lot more people 
You know, there was a lot of people that haven't been there since Rita. And so we're trying to get more and more people to come back. And a lot of these people used to come back before Rita. They remember all the family memories and things. And so we're trying to get them back there to make those memories again, most of them with their grand grandchildren now. But we're trying to get them back out there. But if, you know, they're used to riding things. Of course, we used to all ride vehicles back in the day. But now they're, they're, they have these golf carts and things. And when, there's a, when somebody makes a phone call to the sheriff's office, all of a sudden everybody has to stop. And so it just causes an issue. They just don't know when, when can we and when can we not. So if we pass and say, this is the roads you can ride on, this is what you can ride, that you need to be a licensed driver, you need to follow the stop signs, you need to follow the speed limit, things like that, then at least now the sheriff's office can do their job of enforcing and stopping the people that are not following the, the rules and the laws. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Uh, Greg Broussard? For, for you, stop signs on the Peak Boulevard, Holly Beach. Thank y'all. Greg Broussard, resident of 24 Duke Ranch, Holly Beach. Uh, we just recently had, as when we uh, talked about passing, pushing to pursue getting the golf carts and the side by sides uh, legalized, uh, as many of the uh, residential areas in Louisiana, if you go to River Ranch and Lafayette or some of the native communities, they all do it. So that's one, one thing is we're just trying to uh, keep the honest people honest and, and take the bad people off the streets. But during that same meeting, we, we've had one of the biggest issues in Holly Beach is speed and trying to protect the kids because there's, there's, there's lots of kids on, on, on busy weekends playing, riding bicycles, uh, walking up and down on the streets and stuff and such. So the big, one of the biggest issue, issues currently right now is speed. Currently, the boulevard don't have stop signs. So if you're going north and south, you have to stop at every street. But the streets are all straight. There's no stop sign. And this is where people get up, you know, at like Teal Street. You're coming in with, from the from Texas. You come in off uh, off uh, 82. You climb on to Teal Street, and you can go all the way to Sunny Moe's shop on the other end. And and they got people driving 50 miles an hour. And and the speed limit in all of Holly Beach is nothing but 15. So uh, one of the suggestions by the the recent. Uh, community meeting was to put stop signs at the boulevard to stop in the center, which would be Lafitte. So we're, I, I was asked to come in and make that as a proposal to y'all if y'all would consider putting stop signs at Lafitte Boulevard in the center. At least uh, it may not solve the problem, but at least it'll give them two tickets to write when the police catch them. <laughs> uh, we kind of thought about maybe putting more than just one sense when I'm thinking uh, every intersection might be how would y'all handle that uh, well I know it's a lot of stopping but that's a lot of going slow well we, we wanted to start with that and see if that takes the problem I mean and uh, and go from there you can always add but it's hard to think of well, you heard you heard from the end you don't need to change we're going to do that in house so we can do we, like I said, we wanted to start small and see if that would solve it. The, the, this, isn't, this is fixing a, a, a symptom. This isn't solving the problem. The, solving, the problem is hopefully Sheriff Ron gets his approval to get a full-time deputy at, um, on beach patrol. So we, we, have, have, we have that already. Uh, we have people, one beach patrol already, full-time beach patrol, and we're working on getting some more in there for that. Yeah. Well, that's that's going to. It's just a matter of hiring enough people for that, right? And that is going to cure the problem. Nobody speeds when the you know uh, when the police officer is there. It's when so we need more presence uh, to uh, get these people. What's good about the stop signs, like y'all was suggesting, is if you have a crash, a vehicle crash on those roads, you can't necessarily prove that person's at fault by speeding unless you do unless you do a reconstruction 
but with witnesses and so forth, you can show they was at fault for running the stop sign. Thank you. One question? No, all I would like to say is that with the Grand Festival, I've been going out for over 50 years. I've never seen that many people. So people, and I saw on the Facebook that they, they made the top 100 features in the nation, which I, I thought was odd, but they did. They made it, and there's, there's people coming from all over. And they're not just residents in Hollow Beach, it, it's crowded. Yeah, the the crowd Grand Festival out. is now a statewide festival. Yeah. And the estimate, from some of the officers and other people, there's was over 5,000 people at the at that I mean, it was well, well attended. You had people from Constance Beach all the way to the very uh, park, almost both of them. So we're trying to plan for the future, accommodate, and uh, make, get, get additional parking spots, you know, some of the projects we've done in the past have helped, and I'll just give an example. When we cleaned the boulevards off, uh, it, it took, we, we were now able to put the portalettes, put all the signage out, the rip currents and everything else out there to where it's visible, and people are now able to park on the boulevards before they get onto state property at the beach. So that's been a huge success. If you, if you were there that weekend, you could see people uh, you know, perpendicular parking, or parallel parking on egress, all up and down. So people are, uh, uh, some of the projects we're doing is showing the benefits. On the uh, holidays, on the big days, we have all hands on deck. It's not only Holly Beach, it's Bays Beach, Rutherford Beach, uh, Lakeside, and Bears Landing. So that's what we're working on the big, uh, holidays like 4th of July and things like that. Uh, I did speak with DMV and they can give those, um, those they can take care of this here. In the, yes, in the local office. Here. Okay. <coughs> well, I got another Green Corps, Mr. Mike Francis. Public Service Commission. Sheriff Ron and uh, Clerk Susan, it's good to be back. Uh, here. It's good to be back in my favorite parish. Uh, I was just reelected last November to another six year term. Got a good vote in this area. Thank you very much for what you all done for me. And hopefully I'll return the favor as your public service commissioner. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Senator Boyd for uh, what they've done. Uh, y'all see what the staff that showed up here with. Uh, you know, a year or so ago, they looked like they may be leaving town. And instead, they decided to spend several million dollars because of their, their, their vision that they see here in town. And I do too. And I strongly encourage them, and I'm glad they did that. So, well, thanks again to Center Point, all you folks. And uh, I want to introduce two of my chief people that, that help, uh, help me do my job. Uh, Ms. Janice Perkins is ahead of my staff here, Janice. Uh, she's, she's the boss. At, uh, and then Eric Lutenshine there is, uh, is her, her right hand. And uh, thanks to those. And uh, there was a question about calling in to uh, the, the office trying to get a hold of center point. Uh, if you can't get them, you call Janice. Uh, Janice is their best friend. She'll do the job done uh, if the center point can. Uh, on another subject that uh, I'm really proud of is the fact that uh, we're working hard with Jeff Davis Electric. Uh, they are uh, putting together a package. We're working on it now. Most of you know it. And hopefully by this time next year we'll be close to be completed. Almost $400 million electric transmission project for uh, Cameron Parish. It's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really something special that you all should all be proud of. It. And that's uh, just kind of laying the groundwork. Uh, one day we might have some uh, hurricane proof hotels sitting on the island. Huh? Believe me. Believe me. Believe me. Okay. But anyhow, uh, thank y'all for the opportunity to serve you for what you do. We're all public service. And, uh, you know, sometimes people ask me, why do you do that public service? And uh, a lot of times uh, it's only to serve God and country because uh, we get a lot of things that cause or, or challenges to us. Y'all have any questions? 
Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go to number seven, Mr. Lynn Kimball, food truck ordinance. She just wants to explain um, the um, the commissaries that we've had some questions about. Is that what well, she was a state yeah. I'm with I'm, uh, Ryan's boss. Um, he's out of town. So I thought we were coming here um, for the Holly Beach thing, and then we were going to lead into this. Um, apparently, the Holly Beach was uh, the mobile trucks were not leaving. And they were setting up, and they were frustrated, and the people were frustrated, the, the, the residents. And so we were getting continuous calls about it. Um, there is really no way for us to know if they're there as, other than people complaining. At that point, then we'll um, go out and talk to them, send them a letter, um, and they'll acknowledge it. It'll happen again the next time. And it's typically what Ryan was telling me was around 4th of July when it happens. Um, or I guess when there's going to be a festival. But the festivals are exempt from regulations for us. As long as it's declared by the governing body. <coughs> the next thing that we were, um, I was going to talk to you about is the food trucks uh, here in Cameron. The, they the, um, I guess the allowance for the commissary, commissary is now up. Um, <coughs> and they need a permit. Uh, the parish, Robin and Ryan have been working together about this. Uh, we met with, we met and we talked about it. The Department of Health is not going to, it, it's not changed, right? We allowed them to operate that way for the time frame to re <coughs> recover. We're still recovering and all that. But now it's more of a permanent situation. And so what they've asked us is how how can they proceed and still operate as, as is? <coughs> they need to be, as I'm gonna say it, stationary, hard plumbed to the, the commissary needs to be hard plumbed in order for it to be a permanent location for us. <coughs> permanent location for the parish is different. Uh, your, your ordinances say differently. I am saying what they have is okay as long as they're permanently plumbed. We're going to permit that commissary as long as they meet all the requirements, which was having a restroom, um, and, and, and I did a quick review for Yaman's place, and I'm going to look at trustees, and we're going to be very consistent with the regulations, and they may have to update some things. But what's going to be required from the parish is that the CBO will have to provide a letter stating that it is sufficient for the parish ordinances. It meets state. If it meets the state's requirements, we need to make it meet our requirements. So make our requirements be more state's strict, requirements. which I think is the con concern at this point. Mm -hmm. we, whatever your requirements are, if they meet your requirements, our requirements, you're the state. Yeah, we don't, we don't add. We don't want to talk to state. We want to Elevation it. and all that thing. We don't regulate that. Right. That's not mine. If you said that they can be a commissary like they are, as a movable trailer, as long as they're hard piped in, Storm comes, they're gonna take all the, they can disconnect, they can haul it out here. Right. But it's hard piped into the city, city sewer, hard piped into the water system. Right. And if they have all the sinks and bathrooms, I mean. And so, there's so a you're saying that this is, what, what you're saying is, what they have right now is good. They have a list of items that will be required in order to be a commissary. What do they have to change? 
in order to change, um, and I, right before I came in here, I thought of something. Um, the fire marshal is going to be a permanent fixture now. The fire marshal will have to have a review. Um, the uh, CBO letter from y'all, the, the parish, stating that um, building codes are met, um, electrical, plumbing, and all that has to be provided. Um, they are going to put in writing uh, that they're only going to allow one mobile food truck, and that's going to be the one that they are working with. A few things like uh, fixing just documentation, they interact, uh, need to correct their um, information. The location, they have to fix the dumpster pad, which has been a pain since the hurricanes. It's brought forth a lot of information that we weren't or a lot of problems that we weren't enforcing and need to be fixed. So I've already talked to them about that. Um, other than that, it, it's really, it's sufficient for us because they I have the- One of the issues was the elevation. But my deal is if they have their commissary on wheels, just like their food truck, I don't know why they can't leave them on the road. And they're, and they're not, they're gonna haul these out. If something comes, I'm gonna haul it out. So I don't see the problem. Yeah, that would be a FEMA issue. They piped it in. They piped it in. They're permanent. 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 Then they have to follow the other. I could get with Carrie and get with the FEMA. Yeah. Well, uh, I know Mr. Miles has been kind of keeping up with this as well. So um, if we have to get with the Louisiana State Uniform Construction Code Council to get clarification, um, I'm sure he's going to do that before issuing and authorizing that. And that's why I called the fire marshal yeah. because um, they're going to go through and do the architect review. And that, um, I also got the numbers for them to contact just to find out the extent of the review because they're not going to have cooking equipment. It's basically storage in there, but they still are in operation. So they still have to have a review. And, that, and that's why I called for clarification prior to coming yeah. down here. So even if it's portable trailer, they will do a review on it. Because it is hard fun. Now, when I was talking to the lieutenant, he was explaining to me that it may be kicked back and said no worries, because it is a trailer. But they need to, we need to make sure that it prosperous. Yeah. Okay. We'll work through it, guys. If this is, you know, what you all want, we'll, we'll figure out a way to make this happen. Make it work. Has there been any, you ever have much more people in the camera here? Yeah. In the definition of commissary? Never. Okay. So what, would you explain to us what a commissary is and what it has to contain? Real, quick, real quickly, we don't want to be, be but. I brought the definition. <laughs> so I'm not gonna make anything else today. Um, a commissary is a catering, a catering establishment, restaurant, or any other properly equipped place in which food containers or supplies are kept, handled, prepared, packaged, or stored. An operating base location to which a mobile food establishment or transportation vehicle returns at least once daily for such things as vehicle and equipment cleaning, discharging liquid or solid waste, refilling potable water tanks and ice bins, and storing food and supplies. So let me ask you, the commissary has to be a place of business that's actually serving food. <coughs> so stored food. The commissary, the commissary, the commissary not the little public truck, the commissary. The commissary mm -hmm. is simply a location, mm -hmm. a hub, where they can go and refill, re-get, redo, overflow from a, a mobile truck. A mobile truck is not made <coughs> to be a permanent restaurant. It is made to temporarily prepare food, mobile. Um, so in order to meet the state regulations, it has to be mobile. That mobile truck has to be mobile. And they cannot be connected to sewer. And they cannot be connected to water. So they are at their commissary and they can return daily to do all the necessary things to meet state regulations, but not have to meet the um, permanent fixture. Is there a size footage on, on the commissary minimum footage? So, and that was a great point. I think I get where you're going with this. Um, 
one thing that we want to do is verify that everything is sufficiently sized to handle the operation. And so my concern is um, they're operating this full-scale restaurant out of this little bitty mobile truck. How is he doing it? How are they doing it? So in my list of questions, I have, give me your detailed operation, because I feel like <coughs> in the future, say somebody comes and builds a sufficiently sized commissary, then they're going to say, well, how are they doing it if it's so small? And they are only going to be allowed their one operation at that facility. So I have requested for them to clarify what's going in and out of that out of that facility, out of the mobile truck. So you guys are going to be actually looking at the, each commissary individually? Mm -hmm. Okay. When they go get their permit, they're going to have to identify their spot. You'll go look at it. It's going to be, um, we're going to be doing a detailed plan review, which we should do every time. Um, this was allowed mm -hmm. for so long, once again, for the recovery, so we can work together to get it back going. But in any other parish, this happens every time. And it, every time is that commissary sufficiently sized <coughs> to if he got five things of brisket delivered where is he going to put it he can't put it on that mobile truck where is he going to put it it's got to go in that commissary <coughs> can't go in his house can't go in a temporary storage but our situation we're very limited on what we allow on the ground mm -hmm. the commissary will probably won't be on the ground it doesn't have to be elevated <coughs> we're kind of put a rock and a hard place on size and this is going to be, there is no concern with the size of this from LDH. This will be a parish ordinance situation. And it's, it's no concern to y'all if it's on the ground or in the air? As long as it's properly <laughs> formed. Okay. So, I, it, well, while it seems like LDH is the holdup, it's not. I don't, the, L, the code allows it as long as it's properly Set up. Not elevation. One last question. Their their commissary has to be theirs. Can, can they use another existing business for a commissary? Mm -hmm. can't do okay. Can they hold it back to the they they move it. It. They can And that's the problem. And I'll tell you, we had one individual from Texas call regarding the the venture or whatever over there, and he was he was frustrated and he. <coughs> He wanted to be able to use his Texas food trucks here, that they, they were permitted in Texas, but it's a different operation. It's a different code regulation. We operate under the state of Louisiana, Title 51. They operate under their um, county, um, their county regulations. And so I explained to him in full detail for a very long time why he couldn't just come over here and do this. And then, so, his argument was, well, you're making this to where I just can't do it. And I said, that is not what I'm saying. He wanted to use a commissary in Lake Charles. And I said, well, you go back every day. So you have to drive from over there all the way around to Lake Charles. And he said, well, you're saying it's a 50 mile radius is a, a rule of thumb. That's what we use as a rule, the distance from the commissary. He said, I could go straight through the marsh or swamp, whatever he called it and get to the commissary he said no sir but it, i mean he was trying to pull every which way of how he could do this so he finally and i have not spoken to him since then and i don't think he's gotten the permits he um found a location in venton that would potentially allow him to do it but like i said i haven't heard back from him because it's not just that easy i think you asked most of my questions i just got one more Sure. <laughs> Can more than one food truck use the same commissary? Yes. Okay. I'm good. As long as they're not loaning your commissary can support you. As long as I approve, LDH approves it. Okay. Not so I. It has to be efficient size. Right. So you can't have, for instance, their mobile trucks, Yaman and trustees, that they have right mm -hmm. now operating as a commissary would not be sufficiently sized to accommodate another mobile unit. I have a question for you. The gentleman that was supposed to speak before you, Mr. Lane Temple, does he work for you? No. No, he doesn't. So, so does he have the right to tell anybody of any food 
uh, concession trailer or whatever that they uh, need to pull up and move to the commissary. So what happened was tit for tat, right? So somebody apparently told on Hill, he told on them, we were going back and forth, and that's what happened. I, mean, <coughs> I don't know who, why he was coming to this. Well, I know why he was coming to this. One of the reasons is this young lady sitting right back here has corn ice. Okay. That wasn't and, us. And that I was did not report him. We didn't report him. I've never reported anybody. I never met him before that. We but never met him. He was harassing her at both Crab Fest and the 4th of July event. So the Crab Fest is a declared festival. <coughs> you do not have to have. <coughs> and that's exactly what the Sheriff's Department However. Does. My you problem. do have a permit, so you should operate within the guidelines of the LDA. Okay, my problem right. is uh, this individual who, who is cleared, we actually give him a permit, okay? He actually accosted that young lady right there twice, cursing her out, getting on her wagon, cursing her out. That is a civil. Okay, okay. It's civil. Kona <coughs> um, ice is different than, I would that. say, yes. than... Let's use the comparison what we have here that we know. Vinyaman mm -hmm. and Tressie, right? Right. They are coming in with already prepared, everything's done. They're not doing hot dogs, they are doing snow cones. The water that comes out of that thing is not going to contaminate. Thank you. Um, they still have to follow the state regulations, <coughs> obviously. But I'm not going to expect them to return as often to their commissary as a facility that is preparing any type of food because they have to wash, rinse, and sanitize. They have to do all this stuff more often, and so they will need more water and more uh, sewer. But he has no right to tell anybody to return to the commissary. He has no authority from LDH. No, we don't. Thank uh, you. And that is LDH's, that's y'all's regulation. That's to our regulation, to and to the only the thing commissary. we would ask is that Y'all are eyes and ears here. Mm -hmm. You want to make your residents happy. We want to we want to follow the rules. I would say that if you see somebody being stationary, Kona, you let us know. If, it, if and they called me about Kona Ice and they were here for 12 hours, that's completely different than a food truck operating with food preparation, staying there for 12 hours. That's not acceptable. Are we understand. We understand that. And so in the event that with that, I heard some of it, I forgot about it because um, I've been out of town since then. But um, I did hear about something going to the tag and all this. Um, the only thing we ask is that if they are staying, because it happened, because it happens all over, that you let our office know so that we can send a, um, either a, a notice of violation or something. And I will tell you, somebody else I feel like was complained on, yes. and that's what initiated all of this. So I think his snow cone is a snow cone truck as well, yes, it's, but it has it's a food, food on it. So This is a food trailer, and it has a snow cone stand on it. And he got mad at me and tried to come to Highbury and kick my butt. <laughs> Which I begged him to come, but sometimes. My problem with it is he, he does not work for LDH. He has no right to tell anybody anything. So in, I guess I can put it in perspective for me as an LDH employee. We expect people to call and complain mm -hmm. because that's how we find, you know, we only see a picture in time. I'm not coming to Holly Beach and sitting out with my four kids waiting to check food trucks. I'm just not doing it. So if we hear it, that's how we handle it. But I can't expect staff, like I told Ryan, I was like, I don't expect you to go to Holly Beach on your 4th of July weekend no. and monitor food trucks. I just, we can't do that. Holly Beach does a good job. They got good people going there. They got good uh, trailers going there. They don't beat the problem. My, my problem is, individual speaking for LDA. No, and that would be a civil, like, like I said, if they are misrepresenting to us, then that would be a civil. I don't know, they were telling them what they had to do. I mean, you know. But they were not saying they're LDA employees, right? Hopefully. Uh, I've, got, I've got a question for you. 
you just read the meaning of a commissary. You said in the beginning you had no problem with horror typing. So we're at war. What are they horror typing? Okay. So the trailers? The commissary trailer. It is, okay, take it like this. The commissary says no portables. Okay, take it like this. Because I called and I was asking, I mean, it's, I, I was expecting these kind of questions. Um, every single school in Lake Charles has a portable building, portable. But they're all stationary, they're all permanent fixtures. A building portable. Is it a utility trailer turned into a food trailer? So have you- see, before we go, we're gonna talk about this, but- I am not the building ordinance, that would be your enforcement, your building enforcement. Okay. So they would need to meet the building code. If, if you were asking me, that's not what I regulate. So if it was me as a parish <coughs> trying to make sure I was consistent, I would make sure that my building enforcement code enforcer made your, sure that your this. definition commissary through the portable trailer out of the wall. So, but it's not portable, right? Because it's hard to find. So it becomes a not portable, permanent, stationary. And because I, that's what we talked about, I, I called Baton Rouge on that one because I was like, no. Because Ryan, Ryan said, this is going to cause problems. And, and, and we don't want, you know, problems. We want to make this work. The first thing you do is pull the axles and the tongue off of it, just like you do a trailer house to make it permanent, not movable. Your building enforcement right. would have to be that. I am not going, because to me, if you're hard plumbed, you can't, and, and, and there's all kinds of stuff around it. So one thing that we do in Lake Charles, if it's got the, the propane tanks on the exterior of it and, and chairs and all that stuff, no, that's a good point, thank you. Um, it's, not, it's not a mobile unit. You can't have the water heater outside or the propane tanks outside. Your, you're not gonna pick that up every day, run back, empty your water off every, every four hours if you're a large scale. Um, mobile food truck, uh, uh, an active one. But as far as with these mobile food trucks, because they're mobile, even though they're there every day, they're not hard plumbed, they, you can back up to your trailer, um, they can't have seating there. <sighs> Picnic tables or chairs, tables, anything like that implies that they're a permanent picture that you can go sit there. So then you have to provide a um, walk-in restroom and all that kind of stuff. So the mobile fixture is supposed to be a temporary place. So we have it's going to be blocked, elevated, everything. Right. Doesn't matter if it's on the trailer on it or not. It's got to be a permanent building. Right. So they have a 10 by 12 building elevated with all their freezers in, everything. Say it'll work. Except that you guys voted no to a variance. <laughs> yeah, but they have a, so they have they have a kind of small building, they have like a 10 all the way back and the building and make meet elevation, put all their You'd have to meet wind loads, building supplies, codes, so. all of that. Yeah. So I, I just think, you know, thank you, Amy, for all, all the information, but there's really no action for you to take today. It's just receiving information, and this is just something that your CBO is going to have to take under advisement and make a decision on. And so we'll report it to you after we get some guidance from FEMA and we look at our ordinances and if it requires an ordinance change on our behalf, creating a new permit class just to make this allowable, then that's something that you can consider at a later date. All right, thank you very much. All right. I'm, I'm, I don't know about everybody else, but between the beaches and the food trucks, I'm just beat upside down. I ain't never seen so much controversy about food trucks and beaches. <laughs> Been going to the beach in 45 years, they never had problems. <laughs> I've got every problem in the world with the beaches now. <laughs> well, no, that's good. We, we were smoking Marlboro, not vaping like it used to be today. That's terrible. All right. So, we asked yeah. for forgiveness. <laughs> we were tough back then. We ain't, ain't like that before. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, review our agendas, please. Hey, can I make a request? Uh, Next month, could you have a yeah. uh, a report to us on the uh, uh, process of our buildings all over the parish? And what I want is a uh, timeline on when the construction is going to start. And if it started, 
where it is at in its process. Okay. And yeah. have that report for us, Nick, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I get questions from time to time. Well, I heard, you know, some months back, I was going to build a new uh, whatever. Robin, would you be permitting? Yes. Or is it Kara? I know Kara ain't permitting no more. Can't hang. I'm here. Hello. I'm all ears. <laughs> I'm supposed to use JD, Gilrich, he's good? He, yes, we have uh, approval from Rabbit mm -hmm. Drainage. There's another one. Gregory Shore is good. Yes. Yes, all three of them. Yes, they all three of them. What did we do on the uh, OEP building? We went out for a smaller size or something? No, we, we uh, just re-bid it, but we removed the uh, electronic bidding requirement. <coughs> so uh, smaller companies were able to submit um, all of their bids um, in person. Oh, okay. And so we had more competitive bids, and so those are going to be recommended for acceptance today. And um, everything came under budget, and it and the mosquito control Commit. alternates under budget. Come back under budget? It was over. Imagine that just by going by paper. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to uh, talk about agenda item 25. Um, it's going to be the Rockefeller Refuge Shoreline Stabilization Project on uh, consideration by the jury for accepting the bids. And uh, we, re we did receive one bid, um, but that we will only be able to um, award the base bid due to our construction funds. So, this, and this project is funded by the Restore Funds for uh, Camera Parish Restore Funds, Calcasieu Parish, and also CPRA. Focus on the refuge. Hey, Sophie okay. will be here to make sure we have the time in our motion. Yes, I sure will. John, no. hey. See about getting to put that spoil on that front. Start using that for a barn lid. This way, that way. For a barn instead of creating more marsh in the back. And then if we don't go back offshore with it, but use it for that burn system talking about long term for three dollar and burns. Yeah, we have I see a port board down here too. Right. And it can it might not make it that good but you start building. We well, start putting it out the ground and we can take the odors and then Well we are looking at identifying some storage sites for uh, possibly for these maintenance stretching activities. So um, we have to do Yeah. But thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, we have yeah, start building that burn, put it in the wall still burn. We are looking into that. Oh, I got I got the same material. We can just get somebody to come get it. It's in the bottom of that <laughs> <laughs> Hey Tom, ask them to stay, please. Tom, anybody got any more questions? Mr. President, we have one add-on. Um, it's going to be a resolution to combine precinct 16 CW, 16 B, and 4 W. It's the final thing on all the redistricting. What is all this precincts? It was the last two. It didn't change anything about the redistricting. Don't change anything on the redistricting stuff. No. Yeah. Somebody tell me all. This no. is per the clerk and register voters' request to make so it what easier is, for people to vote. She can't find and she can't find enough um, election officials to run the precinct, so she's merging what she can. Doesn't change your your voting district. The maps are not any different. The voting districts are not any different. It's merging two precincts into one. So, like, say you yeah, live in Cameron. Cameron has a precinct. Creo has a precinct. Grand Chenier has a precinct. 
she made it like one precinct for all three because you're voting at one place. Well, they all vote at one place in. Anyway. Correct. Vote three Correct. Three it's just to where you don't have to have four or five tables set up. You have one table right. with your commissioners. Oh, the maps feel like we were set. Maps are exact. This, this does not change your maps. It changes yes. your voting. And it, it mainly affects it. So if you live in Grand Lake, but you're in the South Cameron district, you don't have to drive to South right. Cameron you to vote. Go, go to Cameron and vote. Yeah. You have a lockout box. Yes. All this stuff. Yes. Just okay. easier for okay. the commissioners. When they go to vote in Grand Lake for your district right. that has that little section, right. they they'll vote in Grand Lake, right. they'll have a walkout right. for yeah. the other area. Yes, yes. It's just easier for them. That's all this stuff. Right. That's all this stuff. Right. Yep. Okay. No change in maps. Anybody have any more questions? I do have one more. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, just for the record, uh, the Louisiana State Code Council, they have now uh, issued effective August 1st. We will, I know, I hate to say it. We will have a one foot free board requirement for all new construction in special flood hazard areas. So it used to be up to the local, local jurisdiction to enforce that in your ordinance. Now the state has um, enforced it and overruled and it is now effective August 1st. What are you gonna do about the insurance company? Do something about the insurance company. Well, hopefully the Attorney General's office can get moving with that. Yeah, so what's the flood elevation like Limehouse now? What is it gonna be Limehouse? So right for instance, five years ago, it was less than a half foot above zero. What is it today? 18? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the, I mean. We dropped it to nine. It's probably, yeah, I'm sure it's around 13, 14 feet. Miss Robin can help you with yeah. that. Yeah. Meeting. She has like sure, But so any permits oh, no, no, that no, 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 I just. I elevate for 15 probably. But yeah, if y'all get any calls, um, you know, the state has now adopted that. So it's effective August 1st for, for any. So the state is uh, the state adopted. Building yeah, code. It is in the building codes now. If your elevation, if your if your BFE ground is 10.2, you got to go up 11.2. Got to go up an additional. And it, and it normally depends on the zone. So if you're in a BE zone, it's the lowest one on them. Yeah. So we probably require the. Yeah, they all know that. We just never had one foot free board. Oh, well, that's what he was at. He just asked. So, that's what I was asking. Or is it four or four or four or four? No, it depends on the flood zone. It depends on the flood zone itself. Uh, hey, how does that affect the insurance companies? Are they going to uh, go by that? Well, mm -hmm. nope. Nope. Not at, not at this time. So I just wanted to let notify everyone of that in case y'all are getting called. But, um, that was well, that's yeah. All right, any more questions? Just one announcement. Go ahead. Uh, Venture Global launched <coughs> their wheel to skill program that is restricted to only Cameron Parish residents. You have to be 18, you have to have graduated high school. They still do have openings. The first class is scheduled to start on August 7th. It lasts for five weeks, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. It is not a paid class. Um, you don't get paid to attend it, but it is offered free at charge to the residents. They have a few spots available. Um, you have to call, um, let's see, Haley at 337-421-6560. If you're interested in signing up, I'll put this on all of our social media uh, websites, and the class will be held at Suella. Do we have any new hires? We can't send, it's not workforce development. We can't send any of our employees to it. It has to be a resident of Cameron Parish. Um, that's the only thing. So anyone that doesn't currently have a job and wants to get a um, Class B CDL license free of charge, if you can figure out how to get to Suella Monday through Thursday, eight to four, you can yeah. take this class. And then they do not promise you a job. This is not a, um, directly related to hiring at Venture Global. They are just trying to educate the public and provide them a way to, you know, to be hireable throughout the parish, especially with all of the construction that's going to be going on in the next year or two. Any more questions? Any 
Any more from y'all? I think that's enough for one day. All right. Meetings adjourned.